In today's episode, I'm super excited. We're going to be bringing on author and experienced team leader, Nick McLean. You guys do not want to miss this episode. We're going to talk about his new book, uh, Million Dollar Agent, and how you can implement his strategies to uh, be successful. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Agent Bridge Podcast. I'm Brandon Baca, Marine Corps veteran and 15-year realtor, broker, and coach. And I'm Arl Hessen. I'm a Fortune 500 C-suite executive, real estate investor, and entrepreneur. The Agent Bridge is the proven path to real estate success without the burnout. Okay, guys, I'm super excited for this episode. I don't even remember. I don't even remember what number it is, but uh, we'll put it down at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, we're closing in on forty. We're closing it's in on 40. Or forty. Yeah. yeah. Um, please uh, don't forget to like and subscribe um, wherever you follow uh, our podcast, whether it's Apple or Spotify or YouTube or wherever it is. We'd love to uh, have you like, subscribe, comment, give us some feedback there. The other exciting news is we're releasing our uh, three series. The three series we did, Supercharger Success, we're releasing that in one ebook called Supercharger Success, surprisingly enough. And um, so make sure you take time to uh, download that. We'll put that in the show notes. Um, it'll be uh, agentbridge.com forward slash supercharge. That's right. So yep. you can download the book, agentbridge.com forward slash supercharge. All right. And as always, let's talk about uh, the crazy real estate market. Uh, as uh, I like to say that I stole from uh, John Chet Black, it is neither a good market or a bad market. It is a real estate market. So let's talk about what's going on. What do we have for updates? Yeah. Uh, you know, Fed had their meeting. They released the minutes. People digested that. Um, obviously, they didn't like what they, they heard. Um, kind of rates went to the moon a little bit on us last yeah. week. Yeah. Um, but you know, the CPI data releases this morning, um, it's actually already been released. Um, it looked a little better than they anticipated. So that should bring rates a little bit back below six uh, or below seven rather, I would hope. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we're, um, all we need is this inflation to get under control and we should be heading in the right direction. Right. Okay. Well, let's get into, uh, our content for today. Um, so we are bringing on author Nick McLean. So Nick is the author of a book called million dollar agent. I'm excited to uh, visit with him. And he also he's an experienced team leader. So uh, Nick McLean is an executive real level real estate broker. His team sells more than 500 homes and produces over 250 million in sales volume annually. Through his years of trial and error and high value education, he has discovered what it takes to build and maintain his position as an industry leader. He not only passes on his knowledge as an elite real estate coach with John Cheplak Select Coaching, but he also provides his own team with training sessions each morning and numerous opportunities to expand their credentials and professional development. Nick McLean is also a former wildland firefighter and trained commercial Boeing 747 pilot. He prides himself on clocking out at 11 a.m. so he can be a devoted father, husband, and competitive XC mountain bike racer. Nick wrote Million Dollar Agent to share his business acumen with everyone. Nick, welcome to the program. We're so happy to have you, man. Thank you for taking some time to be here. That is a resume. Yes, it is. <laughs> That's a, I love the bio. Yeah, thank you for that. You're um, welcome. Always, always interesting to hear your someone else. In the bio. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I actually had on there. I had on their ice road trucker at one point, but it, yeah, I worked. I worked for the ice road trucker. In the <laughs> Did you really, Carlisle? Uh, yeah. But I took it out because I wasn't actually the ice road trucker. Right. I just worked at that company. I'm like, you know, I was a Boeing 747, and I yeah. did fight fire, and I loved it, and I was in the trenches. So I'm excited to be here. Can you? I, I would like for you to walk us through the process of how you went from airline pilot. To a real estate agent, what did that look like? What was that like? Uh, yeah, what is well, you know, I I was aspiring. I was a commercial airline pilot flying international cargo, and you know, you you're on and you're off. And I thought I'd get my real estate license mm -hmm. as a side hustle when I was home. Right. You know, my my thought was when I become captain, I'll be making so much money <laughs> that I'll need to invest in real estate. And I thought as a real estate investor, it makes sense to have a real estate license. Mm -hmm. And you come to find there's pros and cons to that. I mean, I think as a real estate investor, it might be better not to have your real estate license yeah. in some aspects, but sometimes it does help get deals. So I got my real estate license when I was I got sick in Bangkok. 
uh, Thailand. I got sick, so sick. Oh. And I was stuck there for like nine days because the airplane, the airplane took off and it wasn't going to be back for nine days. So I signed up for my online real estate course and got my license. I mean, wow. that's how easy it is to get a real estate license. Right. So long story short, the airline I was working for ran out of money. So I was laid off and I got into real estate in 2008. Wow. You know, yeah. um, I have a corporate background and my my story is not dissimilar to that. I, I um, have been an investor for a long time. So I've invest, invested in real estate since 2002, um, but I had a corporate background. I was a CIO and then I just decided, hey, if I'm going to be investing in real estate, why not get my license? <laughs> and that's how my kind of journey started as well. So it seems like we had similar you know, thinking uh, on that, on our strategy, but... Yeah, absolutely. certainly a life changer at some point because you leave the corporate world and you go do real estate full time. Yeah, you know, and part of the real estate, the the attraction to real estate was I could be home every day. And yeah. As a commercial airline pilot, I was gone twenty one days a month straight. <laughs> yeah, that's and, crazy. You know, to you know, you read in my bio, father and a husband, and that was really important to me. Even at twenty five to twenty seven, I'm thinking at some point in my life I want to do that. And being away in Europe and Asia isn't going to be conducive for a positive <laughs> outcome there. Right. So I bit the bullet and it was hard to give up flying. Um, but I'm still a pilot at heart and I still fly for fun. Oh, that's great. I love that. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm interested though, to have like the thought to me about having an airline pilot mind and in getting into real estate because so many real estate agents come into this business or the, the, the assumption people have is that you have to have a, certain type of personality or that you have a, have a certain mindset to be successful as a real estate agent. I would say as an airline pilot, you probably have a little bit more of a technical mind, you know, yeah. getting into this. Um, what was that like? What was, uh, what kind of approach did that help you bring into real estate? Yeah. So I, I think in terms of a process and, you know, departure and destination it, with waypoints in between, hmm. And you hear real estate agents that talk all the time about like, you know, work with me and I'll, I'll hold your hand every step of the way. You know, you hear these things, <laughs> you can trust me to have a great buyer experience, a great seller experience. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you go into these real estate companies and I've trained real estate companies and you go into these real estate teams or agents and you say, okay, show me your process. Show me your steps. So you're going to take me from here to, to there, A to B. Mm -hmm. What are all the steps? Yeah. And they're like, I, I don't know. Look at a home, jump across the Grand Canyon into home ownership. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But, but the reality is there's hundreds of steps in between. Hundreds of steps in between. Mm -hmm. And so as a, as a pilot, I got into real estate going, oh, my gosh, this is the wild, wild west. There is actually no standardization at all. Oh yeah. There is no training manual. There is no playbook. There is for the agents. That's right. Because the 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 consumer wants it. I can tell you this right now. The consumer wants to work with the agent that has the playbook, that has the game plan, the flight plan for them. This mm. is what I found. So I I was not a natural born salesperson, but I had to study it intently. Um, but what I found was. I call it process-based selling by, by telling the person what's going to happen in what order, they're going to be more likely to make a, a decision and move to the next step. Hmm. So people won't move to the next step if they don't know what the next step is and it's not clear to them. Right. So I just frankly go, I mean, one of my favorite lines is, would you like to know what happens next? Hmm. I, I could be talking to a buyer on the phone. I could be talking to a seller on the phone. I could be in the appointment. I could be anywhere. And I just say, hey, would you like to know what happens next? Not do you want to do what's next? Mm -hmm. Not, you know, do you want to buy it? Do you want to sell it? Just purely, do you want to know what happens next? Or what would happen next if you decided to? And they always say yes. Mm -hmm. They always do. Now, I mean, if they don't, then move on. Right. And then you get to explain what happens next. And then you, the, you ask them to take the next very step and the smallest possible step possible. Right. And then you just keep moving down the line. And so um, I just kind of thought that way. And I still think that way. 
I, I lo- absolutely love the nature of that question. It's because if you say, do you want to take the next step? They're going to go, well, hang on. What is it? Right. Or it's like, are you ready to move forward? Like, hang on. I don't know. You know, cause they're, yeah. you've got people pumping their brakes, but the very nature of, would you like to know what happens next? Uh, presents uh, options to that buyer. It's like, I get yeah. to make the decision on whether I move forward or not. It doesn't sound like a strong commitment. It's just yeah. them wanting to hear more information. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they do. And they really, really do. And so then that puts the pressure, I would say pressure or the responsibility as a commercial airline, because as a commercial airline pilot, you are, when you're the pilot in command, the PIC, you are 100% responsible for the outcome and the results mm-hmm. and, and the process, right? And so the responsibility is... I need to know the process. I need to know the next step. And so I think a lot of real estate agents too, since they don't know the next step, they don't ask that question and they don't explain. Right. You know, just explaining the process will magically open up so many doors for you. And yeah, you might think I need it in writing. Okay, maybe. But you know, you just, you, you lay it out there for everybody and you don't overwhelm people. So you don't tell them like every step in the process, Mm -hmm. you just tell them like one or two next steps. Yeah. And then you keep working them through the process. Um, And I always like to think, you know, as a pilot too, it's like you never skip a step. Hmm. Don't skip a step. Even, even when somebody wants to make that huge leap, let them make the leap, but then make sure you go back and fill in the steps because Mm -hmm. I, you know, I really think about minimizing errors and, and, and mistakes in real estate. And so, yeah. Yeah. So I'll throw it back over to you guys. Well, I think, uh, no, that's, it's very, because a lot of times we, as real estate agents, we like to move things forward and we get excited, you know, if somebody's moving forward quickly, but what happens is you're setting your, you're setting a trap up for yourself uh, because you are creating the possibility for self-doubt for your client rather than confirming the decisions that they've made along the way, right? Because if that if you're going back and saying, hey, this is what we decided to do, right? Then they're taking ownership of that decision versus me just letting them go and, and hey, this is great, I'm excited. But then the next day we've got buyer's remorse or I shouldn't have done that or they're backing up or digging their heels in and being defensive and you're trying to pull them back so that makes a lot of sense when you're talking about the process, just making, having them take ownership in the decisions that were made. Yeah. I mean, and it's funny, the more I studied process and I studied sales and influence and persuasion and cognitive biases, I found that what I was doing incorporated a lot of those things. I'll give you an example. Richard, Richard Thaler wrote a book called Nudge and he he, he, I think he won the Nobel Prize for the, the book. Um, and he advises governments, organizations on how to get large groups of people to comply or, or to, to adopt a certain policy. Hmm. And what, what he found was you don't tell them to do it. Like it's human nature that we don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. We don't want, and that's just something that's already in most, most Americans. And I wouldn't say maybe, maybe you could argue some culture that's not the case, but in America, we don't like to be told what to do. That's right. Okay. So that's, it goes with buyers and sellers, but I just need to nudge them. I just Mm -hmm. need to nudge them to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. And before they know it, they bought a home. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many times in my career, and I haven't, sold homes in five years outside my team where they say, Nick, you know, this is at the destination. Like Nick, we never thought we'd be here. Hmm. Right. Right. When we called you, when we signed up on our website, when we met you, when you reached out to us, we were reluctant. We didn't want this. We didn't know we didn't want it. And here we are. And we're so happy we are here. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I love that fact that it was like, oh man, through the process, they slowly became more and more committed, more and more um, 
open to this idea. And through a series of micro commitments and, and decisions, they end up selling their house mm-hmm. or buying something completely different. And, and for me, I, it was so much, it's just a more beautiful way of selling homes and, and buying homes than having to be just a hardcore closer over the phone. Now you got to learn how to close, right? but, but to have a little bit more mastery to it, excited me and Mm. when what's cool about working under a a framework of process is the the experience is better for the other person and you get more wins Mm. so many agents get uh, struggle because the distance between what works and getting paid is so far away right the 90 day rule what you do today is what you get paid for 90 days Mm -hmm. It's hard to, it's hard to stay motivated because it's really hard. And so I'm always thinking every single day, I'm thinking, I was just talking to one of my agents and business partner, Trevor, last night, you know, he's been with me for nine years on my team. And then we opened up a pest company together. Right. And Mm -hmm. you know, that, that's, what's cool about being a team leader and entrepreneur is you, you get to build opportunities with other people. And I, I was saying to him, I was like, I just need to win. I just need to win. And he's like, I need to win too. And I go, good. And I say this to myself all the time. I'm like, I need to win. And and it's not that I, I'm going to give up or that I'm frustrated or I'm demoralized or like demotivated. It's that I'm looking for that next win. Where is the win? And I don't care how big it is. It doesn't matter. I just need it. And I'll find it. Yeah. And if it's if it's super, super tiny... You know, if it's a like or a comment on my social media post, is it a, is it a new lead? Is it a quality conversation? Is it a, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to take it. Is it a book sale, one, half, I'm going to take that win. And those little wins through the process are huge. And so when you're looking at like, I broke down back in my career, I broke down like how much I made when I sold a home, but I also broke it down to how many homes do I need to show to sell a home? So I knew my metrics. Right. And so, so I could say definitively, if I showed three homes a day, I made $631.50. Right. If I talked to 10 people today, I knew I made $51 per contact. And so those were little wins. Because mm-hmm. I would go home to my wife, who was a teacher, and she, ma- she knew exactly how much she made that day. And she goes, Nick, how'd it go? And I'm in real estate sales and I didn't make a sale. I didn't have a closing. So it's demoralizing to go to your spouse or something and say, well, no, I didn't close anything today. So I guess I'm not providing any money to the family. It's demoralizing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. And we make up excuses about this stuff. Well, you know, I got, uh, I'm hoping for something. I wish for something and maybe I'll make a sale down the road. Right. And so we start and then we hide how good we're doing because we didn't have a closing. Closings don't happen that often. Even when I sold a home a week, you know, six of the six of the days, I didn't make any money. So I broke it down. And so my wife would say, how'd it go today? Awesome. Uh, I just made three hundred and fifty one dollars. Really? You did? Yeah. It's not in the bank yet, but it's coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to play tricks with yourself. You you really do. And, and I'm experiencing that, you know, with consistently training new agents and also uh, uh, a newer generation and a newer mindset that's even more instant gratification that we were when we entered the marketplace. And I love the idea of breaking that down into the dollars per activity. Um, because that, I, I agree with you. It's like, you have to do that or you're going to feel defeated. We talk about you're, that in the open house. Every day, when I figured out that thing, where and I and here's the thing to everyone listening, you don't have to be right on the money. Right. Just you know, if it's a hundred bucks, it's a hundred bucks. Just if you're close, you're close. But when I figured out that trick where it was like every day I'm making progress towards money, I'm making money every day. I show up every day. Mm-hmm. It was fun. And I actually would exceed what I thought I was making oftentimes because I was so consistent every day prospecting, following up. And here's another hack that I do, a, a mind hack that I do with myself too, is I I will make money in the future. So let's say my wife says, how'd it go today? Awesome. I talked to someone that's going to buy a home in two years. So in two years from now, 
because they told me, and yeah. you know, they never lie. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, right, yeah. I talked to somebody that said they're not ready to sell their home today, but they said they're going to probably sell it in two years when they retire. I said, Emily, I just made $5,000 in 2025. Mm-hmm. Well, I, that's the way I think about it is like that conversation today. It's not money today, but it's money tomorrow. And that's mine. Well, but the as other- long as I don't forget, as long as I don't forget and I follow up, that is my listing and that's money in the future. I, and so what's wrong with money in the future? Because here's the thing about real estate is, um, you give up because you're scared you're going to fail in the future. I mean, January one is the worst day of a real estate agents all year. It's the worst day because hmm. you go from whatever you sold to zero. Yeah. It sucks every That's right. year. And so I play tricks to myself. It's like, well, no, I got a pipeline. I got these people in the future. I got lots of money already, already built out. It's future cash flow. And I love future cash flow. And it makes me feel good about what I'm doing and what I'm building and what I'm going towards. That's awesome. I mean, I, I absolutely love that philosophy. So, okay. So you're coming into real estate with this sort of process philosophy. You're thinking differently. You're, you're, uh, you've got your daily activities broken down. You know exactly what you're making per activity. You're making future money. So how to walk me through the timeline of starting with that philosophy and then getting to where you are now or the chain of events that led you to where you are now. To the future, Nick McLean. <sighs> well, you know, I don't know. I don't know where to go with that question except for, you know, I didn't have those ideas out of the gate. No one taught them to me. Okay. You know, so I had really had to stumble into them. You know, my first year I sold one home, hmm. you know, in 2008. Granted, the market crashed in 2008, but mm-hmm. it it was, it, I'd sold one home and I, had to take the bus to work and I couldn't afford the gas. And I don't know about real estate agents today, but I remember gas was $4.50 in 2008 or nine. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't afford to fill up my tank. And there's gotta be agents today at five bucks. Oh, in yeah. Washington state, it's $5. Mm-hmm. You guys don't know this because you're in te- Texas and Tennessee, but yeah. it's very expensive. The cost of doing business is going up. So, yeah. um, you know, I learned it as I went uh, as a way to keep going, just to always keep going. Um, so hmm. I, yeah, ask me another question. And then you yeah. walked and then you walked in from, so there's that. And then it sounds like at some point, I'm guessing in a, in a two to five year period, you started having success as an individual agent. Uh, and then, you know, I, I'm going to combine this with another question. What do you think? Cause at some point you go, boy, I can make six figures doing this job. Right. Mm. Uh, but what do you think is the main skill learned that you have to learn to go from zero to six figures? And then what do you think the main skill is from six to seven? Right. Or the yeah. main mindset. What, what are those sort of things that you have to adapt mentally and emotionally to go yeah. from to, to make those steps? Yeah. So to go from zero to six figures. And we're talking gross or net, probably net, right? Mm-hmm. Is skills. And the skill set you need is under the umbrella of sales. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I embraced the fact that I am in a sales position. I struggled. So I struggled before I came to terms with that and embraced it as an identity of who I was and who I am, who I need to be. Hmm. And, and because I, I think a lot of agents struggle with this is they don't, they don't, they don't recognize they're in sales Hmm. and they see it as something bad. You will always struggle as long as you, you think making money is bad. Filthy rich is fil- you know, filthy, right? Yeah. Money's the root of all evil. As yeah. long as you're as long as you're finishing those sentences, you're gonna struggle in real estate. And if you think you don't like salesy 
you know, I don't want to sound salesy. I don't want to be pushy. As long as you have these scripts running in your subconscious, you're going to struggle. So for to zero six figures, it's sales skills. Yeah. Not just sales, sales skills. So back to my story about riding the bus to work, I got a bus pass because I couldn't afford my gas. So I, my, my real estate office was 45 minutes away, right? In Washington state, that's 45 miles because we don't have traffic. Yeah. So it's 60 miles an hour, <laughs> right? So I, I, I was committed to going to the office every day, right? Not mm -hmm. staying at home, going to the office every day. So I take the bus on the bus. I would read sales books. Hmm. That was the difference between year two and year three is year two, I sold 12 homes. Year three, I sold 32 homes oh, wow. and made, and made $207,000. So I went from $70,000 to $200,000 in a year riding the bus to work. Now, now I can afford gas. So I stopped riding the bus, yeah. but, but the principle here, the key here is I read, I read every sales book I could get my hands on. The little book, the little little book of sales, Gittimer, mm -hmm. you know, the ultimate sales machine, Chet Holmes, how to win friends and influence people, Dale Carnegie, you know, how to stop worrying and start living, Dale Carnegie. I got, I just grabbed them all on Amazon and I read them on the way up. And then I got big into self-help and mindset and all that. And that really propelled me to six figures. Never look back, never look back. And, and. I started calling myself a salesperson, not in real estate. When someone would say to me, what do you do? Right? Before I was embarrassed because I went from a commercial airline pilot, 747 to a realtor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Right. I didn't have a, I didn't put my, my picture on my business card. One, I thought it was cheesy. Right. Two, I was embarrassed to be a real estate agent. Right? Mm-hmm. And then year two, year three, so when people would ask me what I did, I'd say real estate. And people do this today too. They say, what do you do for a living? And they're like, oh, I'm in real estate, right? You know, I flip homes, <laughs> I invest, I, you know, I dabble here, I dabble that, right? To, to, to make up for their lack of sales. Yep. And so, you're, and I noticed this about everyone else. Everyone else, all these other agents were pretending they were more than what they really were. And I knew there was something hiding there. Was, there was some lack of integrity there. And I think the consumer could feel it. So I said, I'm going all in. So when someone said to me, what do you do for a living? I say, I sell real estate. I'm a real estate salesperson. Mm -hmm. 100%. I, and I had to say it in the mirror in the bathroom. I remember, Nick, you're the number one real estate salesperson <laughs> in this area. You are a salesperson. I had to yeah. convince myself. And then I would go into buyer consultations, listing consultations, and I would just flat out go straight for it. And I would just say, you are hiring, you need to, you're making the single most important decision you have to make when it comes to selling your home or buying a home. And that's what real estate salesperson you hire. You hire me because I'm the best salesperson. You need to find the best salesperson, mm -hmm. not just real estate salesperson. And so buyer consultation, I've identified, I've broken down the barrier. I'm not lying. I'm not a wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm here to sell you a home. That is what I do for a living. And I'm really, really good at it. And that's what you want. Because mm -hmm. there's nothing worse, a, there's nothing worse to a consumer that's ready to buy. They don't get served. Right? If you walk into a store and you have money in your pocket and no one's there to sell you something, you get kind of upset. Yeah, it's true. Well, when you go into the store and you don't, you're just you know, you don't really want to be sold, right? So we've been told that people don't want to be, they like to buy, but they don't like to be sold. We've heard this before. Mm -hmm. Unless they want, there's people out there yeah. that want to be sold, right? And, and, and I want to talk to them. And I just felt like I was gravitating to them. And on the listing side, the listing side of the business, just saying, hey, you know, I'm a real estate salesperson. That's why you hired me. You hired me to get your home sold. And I'd win business over and over again because the other agents would pretend they're not in sales. Yeah, you're you're confirming really what we believe about real estate agents, which is we know that two, you know, two years they wash out, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's just the the typical run rate. But your network knows you as a pilot, or they might know you as a teacher or a corporate guy or you know, a military guy or a paint salesman or whatever. 
But so it took you that two years to, to believe it yourself that you're in real estate and then to actually go out and earn the business and then earn the respect of your network that, hey, this guy is good at real estate. This is what he does now. And so it, that third year, you, you know, you take off and people never make it there. No. They never make it there. They never get to the point where, hey, they're actually going to start realizing that this is a career that you can be successful in mm -hmm. because you washed out in the first two. It's just interesting. The, the it is really, and it it's counterintuitive because it's actually what the consumer wants from you. Mm -hmm. They actually want you to be that person. And you've been told because you've never been in sales before or whatever, that that's not who you need to be or you shouldn't be, or that you can do it another way. Mm, okay. Now, <laughs> good luck. Good luck. Now, you know, because what they want is they want the perceived deal maker. They do. They want the deal maker. They want the lead source. They want the Intel. They want the competitive advantage, right? Mm -hmm. They want the scoop. They want the hustler. You know, that's what they want. And you got to deliver it. And so part of the, you know, part of that is there's a lot of things that go into it, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you got to learn about negotiations. You got to learn about contracts. You got to know the market better than anybody else, right? But it all starts with that, you know. I want to go backwards, though. I, because we talk about this a lot, maybe we don't say enough about it, but reading, like what you're putting into your brain is so critical yeah. to re basically redoing your neural pathways and becoming a real estate salesperson. These skills don't yeah. just fall out of the sky. Yeah. I mean, they don't. Like you have to, you know, acquire them somehow, whether it's experience or through other people's experiences or whatever. Yeah, that's a, it's just a critical element. It's a critical element. It really is. So what I, what I found for a hack for me was, and I remember year two, year three, I was reading all these books and I made a, I made a rule. I like, I like having rules for myself. You can call them commitments or whatever, but I like rules. I will implement what I read. I implement what I read. And I, I've met a lot of real estate agents, a lot of real estate team leaders, business owners. They read a lot. And I'm like, man, based on how many books you've read and listened to, you should be doing better. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like you've read, you've read Jim Collins, Good to Great. You've read Beyond Entrepreneurship. You've read all the books I've read. Why are you still struggling? Because all that wisdom's in there. They never implement. Hmm. They never implement. If I hear someone say to me, if I were to teach somebody something, an agent or team leader, because I coach one-on-one, -on -one, that's a good idea. That means they're not going to do it. Hmm. That's a good idea. So knowing things work, knowing things are good ideas, doesn't matter. You have to do them. Right? So many people think being smart and knowing the answer is the success, the key to success. No, it's not because we were trained that way in public school and private school, right? Know the answer, take the test, get it right. And getting it right is what's going to get you to your, your next, the next course, the next class, the next degree, the next certificate. No, getting it right, knowing it and doing it is going to get you to where you want to go. So I would read a book and I would, I would implement it. Somehow, some way, I'd build a system. If I read a sales, a sales book, I would implement that marketing strategy, that headline, that hiring ad. I would use that line on the phone, right? I, and that was my goal for the day. It's almost like if you want to improve your vocabulary, you need to read. You need to read more, but you also need to like use the words. Well, that whole <laughs> process of the, you know, while you're, you know, because you should be out doing lead generation, you should be out doing appointments, but if you're conti continually perfecting your skills and you're reading those things and you're implementing that, you're having a great time. You're like, hey, I tried this thing and it worked, right? And it keeps you in that state of mind of growth, which I think, you know, to me, you know, what I tell our agents is like, you know, really the thing that actually makes you happy is growth. It's not the pursuit of free time or pleasure or whatever the case may be. The thing that actually is going to make you happy is growing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's just that, 
I, I remember that time and being a new agent and and reading alongside uh, doing the lead generation and and what a blast that was. Well, and as you acquire skills, you know your hour of prospecting can probably be done more efficiently. Maybe yep. you get it done in thirty minutes because you're just better at it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> totally. Totally. You know, and I believe I believe in mastery in terms of the way I live my life, and that is, you know, doing something that is hard or difficult and challenging and, and all things are at the beginning, but through repetition, practice, the seeking more knowledge in the subject become, here's the key, here's the key to mastery for me, become easier and more enjoyable. So prospecting really, really hard. It actually is sales really, really hard, but the more I do it, the better I get the easier it becomes and it's more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you can, if you can do things that are hard that other people aren't willing to do and do it enough over time, it's fun. Yeah. And then they look at you like they're, you're crazy. So there was a point, in, there's a point in my life right now, like I'll get on stage and make live phone calls to yeah. prospects from anywhere in the nation. I do live phone calls in front of my team and clients and I have fun doing it. I love watch. I love people watching me do it, hmm. you know? And, That's crazy. And I, so, <laughs> and I have so much fun with fun with it. And I think uh -huh. that's the word is I have fun with it. Like I talk to the person on the other end of the phone and I have, I'm having fun. Yeah. Right. And I'm just playful. I'm a commercial airline pilot, analytical, high C, like at a party, I'm in the corner but you get me on the phone or, you know, through, because I've practiced it so much, I'm so playful. And it's a, it's part of me that I didn't know existed. And it's a, just a beautiful thing. So for anyone listening to this, there's, there's parts of you that are going to come out that are going to be beautiful and, and, and you're really going to enjoy it. And I know this kind of existential on that, but it, it, it's true. Yeah. I, I felt it for myself. That's great. So, okay. So that's zero to six figures. It's just basically embracing that you are a salesperson and perfecting that skill. So yeah. what's, and, and, and applying it and applying, and applying it, it. Yeah. At the application yes. of it. So what is the, what, what's six to seven? Six to seven. So six to seven is, I've seen it done a number of ways. For me, it was starting a team. Mm -hmm. It was starting a team and it was, it was people. For sure. It was adding people to the process and to the systems that I have in place. And so it was because at some point you're going to run out of time. Yeah. At some point you're going to run out of time. So I'll give you an example. So I went that, that year I went to 30 homes, 32 homes. The next year I went to 62 homes. Mm. Right. Solo. Ooh. And delegation. I needs to be. <laughs> no assistant, right? I didn't, I don't remember a single thing that happened in my personal life that year. Yeah. You didn't have a personal life that year. Nope. Not one. And so I re actually regret selling. I don't regret selling 60 homes. I regret, I, I kind of, I don't regret it, but I miss that. I missed that year, a whole year of my life, men in black gone. Yeah. Right? And so out of that became the necessity to figure out how do I get leverage? And so that was an executive assistant. That was mm -hmm. the assistant. And that is key to have an assistant. Now, what's cool is, is I didn't, their teams didn't exist back then. And so there's these teams that are already in place that already have an abundance of staff trained staff, trained listing coordinators, trained tra transaction coordinators, trained inside sales, tra like all these people, like built in assistance. You know, that's why I tell my team members now is like, we, you know, you have, you sold 10 homes last year. You join my team. You now have 33 assistants, full-time assistants. And so that key was an assistant, an executive assistant. Um, and then just delegating the non to, as you hear, non-dollar productive activities to them. Okay. And then focusing on listings, getting listings, more and more listings, marketing those listings to attract more buyers. And then when I had too many buyers, then bringing on agents to work those buyers. 
And there, there's a point in which you got to be really honest with yourself that you think you're better than you really are. So when you go from 30 to 60, what got you there is you you were delivering a better service in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. And people, people could tell your work ethic, your drive, your your knowledge, right? You may not have, have all the experience, but you were out hustling people. But at some point, you're not actually giving them that level anymore because you're getting spread really thin. And so for me... I, I, I realized that when people weren't, my past clients weren't coming back to me as often, um, I was missing out on opportunities and I had to take a piece of, eat a piece of humble pie and say, okay, I got to hire, I got to bring people on, mm-hmm. not for the money, for my goodwill and rep- reputation, hmm. right? And, and so I start, that's when I created that, my team in 2000, 2012. Right. Right. So, yeah. And that's even loaded, you know, in terms of, because when you are adding team members, then you have to teach them all of the processes and then you have to delegate and they're not as good as you are and they can't read your mind and you're having to. So, I mean, a lot of that too, in terms of just becoming a leader probably is pretty pretty heavy and pretty loaded. Yeah. So I hear this all the time, right? I can't, they, they, people say they're not going to do it as well as I can. Mm -hmm. You're the, the ego starts getting in the way of the top producers growth real quick. Because I think the way you perceive yourself isn't actually what you're delivering sometimes. I think we think about ourselves in terms of what our intentions, not our actions. And so when you're doing 50, 60, a hundred deals, I, I, unless you have four or five assistants, I don't think you're delivering it. Right. And, and the truth is there's going to be, when you start creating a team or a brokerage, (laughs) people are going to surprise you. And I've had some ha ha moments in my life, in my career, as, as I invested in people and trained people, like you were saying, you got to now train them to what you do. You now have to explain what you do. That's the hardest part for a lot of people mm-hmm. is Michael Jordan was a terrible coach. Yeah. Michael Jordan is a terrible coach, right? Cause he would just look at people and say, why'd you do that? Did, why didn't you just jump from the free throw line and dunk it? Mm-hmm. Didn't you see the opportunity there? <laughs> Why didn't you do a fadeaway three? It's easy, right? Just do this. And it's like, that's what happens to top producers. They're like, just, just do what I do. And you forgot the fact that you were really bad your first year too. Yeah. And you were probably really bad in your second year. And yeah, you might've sold some homes, but you overcame it with just pure mm-hmm. <laughs> big headed discipline. Grit. Right. Can you break down what you do, what makes you special or what makes the process special and train it to somebody? And I think that's, that's really the key. And so what I was going to say is as you get an assistant, I've never had an assistant that I didn't think it's almost every single time within 30 days, I think they're never going to get it. Hmm. I was telling my wife this last night, first 30 days, they're never going to get it. Maybe I made the wrong hire. Day 30 to this day 60, oh, they're picking up on stuff and and doing it without me having to explain it to them anymore. Day six, day 60 to 90, you know you made a good hire because then they, they start telling you what you're about to forget. Mm. They're picking up your mistakes. And that's when the aha moments come in. And then they take some of the stuff you you've implemented. And made it better. That's a great hire. And you'll find those people. They're out there. And they don't want to be you at all. I think most important lesson is, you know, we talk about delegation and and moving to the next phase. I think like, hey, look, as a real estate agent, the first thing you need to get is a transaction coordinator to delegate the paperwork part of it. Yeah. Um, but in talking about the delegation, there's something that you brought up, and, and this is something we've talked about before, yeah. which is just ego. 
Yeah. It's right. Getting your ego out of the way uh, and thinking like, you know, you're God's gift to real estate. And the <laughs> reality of it is uh, you are going, it's like, look, you have a, you're unique. I, I will say that there are top producing real estate agents have a uniqueness to them, right? Sure. They're hardworking, right? They're great with people. You have to be, um, uh, you've got sort of an internal drive, but there is a point at which the ego starts to get in the way of their own growth. Absolutely. Every time. Yep. And there, so there, there's also the, the dichotomy of the ego is the ego in which they say the person that's looking at the top producer is saying, yeah, but I don't want that. Mm. I don't want their life. Or they, they assume that because they're a top producer that they they're giving up something else they're sacrificing. Right. And that holds them back from, becoming a top producer. Hmm. And I can tell you this, that there's ways to do it where you can become a top producer and have more time too. Well, on you that can, note, you, you talk about clocking out at 11 AM. Okay. Yeah. How was that even? So, you know, uh, any top producers that are listening, they're probably wondering real estate agents that are just getting started. How was that even possible? for someone who's a real estate professional to clock out at 11 a.m. Well, at 11, at 11 a.m., here's, you, you, you are in production. Okay. You're not in production. Right. Like there's no sales agent that's going to clock out at 11 in production. Yeah. I don't think. And have seven figures. It's a really strong operational core. Hmm. So at, 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 on a team level, really strong operational core with leaders. And when I mean leaders is they've been delegated leadership responsibilities that they own certain areas of the business and, and can make decisions without your approval. Not all decisions, but there's a majority of the decisions can be made. They can make those, right? So for me, I have transaction coordinators, listing coordinators, director of sales, director of recruiting, right? Director of marketing, which is a really hard one to give up. I still market every single day, mm -hmm. right? But they have a, a good suite of decisions that I feel I trust them to be able to make on a day-to-day -day operational basis. Now, that doesn't mean I give up the responsibility. I'm the owner. Mm -hmm. I'm the leader. I'm the visionary. So that means they have to report to me. So to be able to get off at 11 or anything like that, you have to have a good reporting system. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that goes, I mean, to the agent that's listening to this too, you know, solo agent, you know, reporting is a concept that I think is important in sales too. For instance, set the tone to your clients and your leads, your leads, your buyers, your sellers. When you communicate with them, they will confirm they got it. Hmm. This will change your life. Confirm receipt acknowledge have you ever sent a property to a a, a, a buyer and they didn't and what'd you think and they don't respond mm -hmm. you know which ones do you like they never respond train your people hey when i send you communication please let me know you got it mm. and i will train my my clients that you know if i send you a text and i say please let me know you got this and they don't i will follow up with them until they do Cause I want them to know I'm not going to send, I'm not going to send communication over cause that's the only thing I have. Mm -hmm. We don't have, we don't have inventory unless you're a builder. We don't have inventory and we don't make things. Yeah. We don't have inventory. We don't make things. We're purely a vessel, a conduit for communication. That's all we are. And the clearer the line of communications, the more money I'm going to make, the more freedom I'm going to have. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, absolutely. so the more I can communicate and the clearer it is and the more it's connected, the better. So I will just get with my people like confirm, 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 because as a commercial airline pilot, if you take off and you don't make reports on your way, mm -hmm. you know, you know what the company has to do. So you take off mm -hmm. and they don't hear from you for like an hour. It's a four hour flight. What will the company do? They're going to, I don't know. They're going to assume you're going down, I guess. Yeah. yeah. 
they're going to call search and rescue. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so in my mind, I'm thinking if I'm calling a client and they don't respond to my emails or if I, if I call my assistant or if I email my assistant or if I'm trying to get a hold of escrow or title or the lender and they don't respond back to me, I'm going to search. I'm going to call search and rescue. <laughs> Are you, who's your emergency contact? When I'm on a, <laughs> Cause I'm calling them too. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's just out of pure necessity for me. And the way I think it's kind of weird when I enter a mountain bike race, I have to put Emily emergency contact, right? Mm -hmm. Because I don't make it back. Yeah. 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 So, so think about that. And you know, so many agents drop the ball because the, it's really, it's really, they're, they're dropping the communication ball. So to be off by 11, it's you establish super clean, clear communication channels and reporting. And so I always own the morning. Like I own the morning seven days a week. So life is a barbell. If you want to get off by 11, guess what? You don't get really days off. Well, I want to make sure we're, we're good on time because, uh, I've still got a couple more questions if you're okay with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things that, uh, is unique about you and your team specifically is that you are, you're a small market, right? But you have a tremendous amount of market share. What I, yeah. I can't remember. What's the market share that you have in your. Yeah. At times, at times we've been up to 20%. Okay. 20% market share. Yeah, for times, a real estate yeah. team is tremendous. Yeah, and it, you, it varies from eight to twenty years. Sure. you know, depending on the years and if it's new, because we don't do a lot of new construction. So when the new construction started dominating the the sales, mm -hmm. that changed the dynamic. But yeah, for year over year, we're we're up there. Yeah, so you're not going like there. There's nowhere you go in your town where somebody doesn't go, "Hey, Nick," right? Um, so. What, I mean, for a real estate agents, that, that's a top producer, because that's where you're kind of going into that sort of additional market share. What do you think are those the fundamentals to building that additional market share? Is it just the adding of team members and growing them? Is it marketing? Is it, what, what is it that, that mm, helps you gain mm, that additional market mm. share? Well, there's a couple strategies there. And I talk about it in my book too. And you can go, you can go wider. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. You could also go deeper. And so my marketplace is 70,000 people up to a hundred thousand. Okay. Okay. And, and I hear it all the time. Well, Nick, you're in a small town. Okay, great. Well, I have clients in Toronto mm -hmm. and that's the top, you know, number five city in North America or show, I have clients in San Diego, LA find, is there a marketplace of a hundred thousand people? within your city, within your metro, within your area, mm -hmm. that you can become the 800 pound gorilla in, or you can be the top three. Life's so much easier when you're in the top three or the top two, mm. right? You've heard this before, Pepsi, Coke, and RC Cola. Like the, the, the sales are drastically different. So one strategy is define your sandbox, really define your sandbox. And, and, and go deep into that sandbox in terms of marketing, geo-targeting, right? Because now that you have that strategy in mind, you can, you can now be tactical, right? Uh, what are all the schools and what are the school boards and what, are the, and, and what are the charities that are there and what are the events and what are the, the, who are the business owners in there? You know, and I think, you know, we always think of ourselves as B2C, business to consumer, which I found fascinating that I wanted to, I wanted to make more money. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's ways about in my book, ways to make more money, right? Sell more homes, sell higher priced homes and, and get higher commissions. And if you can do all three, you don't make a little bit more money. You make geo geometrically more money. Right. So to mm -hmm. answer, go back and go from six figures to a million, six to seven, mm -hmm. more homes, higher priced homes and higher commissions. Mm -hmm. You got to all three. Right. Okay. And notice I didn't say split. Hmm. <laughs> no. Yeah. See, see agents, they go to the split first. Yeah. 
thinking, oh, well, then I, then I don't have to sell as many homes and I don't have to have as high a commission and I don't have to have a high, I don't have to increase my price points. They got it backwards because mm -hmm. increasing your split will not ge geometrically grow your income. I'll say that again. And you might be thinking, well, Nick, you're the broker. Of course you're going to say that. True. It's true, though. It's true, but I was an agent too, yeah. right? And I was on 50-50 splits. Yeah. Guess what? You focus on units, price point, and commission first because mm -hmm. that will geometrically grow your, your income. And that's and if you want to work harder, not smarter, that's what you do first. Right. Because I've, I've seen this happen to agents over and over again. They get a better split and they work less. Yeah. They don't make that's any more money. Happens. Yeah. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. let, let, let me see your tax return. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that, let's go back to uh, going deep. Right. So you can you can now go, okay. And when you're in the top one to three in that certain sandbox that you've defined, you can command a higher commission. You, the business owners know who you are. And let me get back to the business owners. I read a book on affluent sellers, affluent real estate sellers. And just, I was studying affluency a lot, high end luxury, because I wanted to increase my price points. I wanted to go from manufactured home to mm -hmm. homes on the lake. Seems yeah. smart. It was something crazy like, at, at, I don't know what year it was, but let's say two decades ago. And I don't think it's changed much. 57% of all high-end and luxury homes were owned by business owners. You th I thought it was like doctors, surgeons, attorneys. No, mm -hmm. it was business owners. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so when I realized that, I was like, oh, I got to know all the business owners. Mm -hmm. And you know who business owners love talking to? other business owners. I mean, look, at, <laughs> look at us right now. Yeah, that's right. Here's what happens to business owners and entrepreneurs as they grow and get successful. They lack connections and relationships and friendships. They actually seek out friendships. A lot of people join masterminds because they're looking for like-minded friends. Yes. They're looking for connections and relationships. So one one ascension model for me locally was me going, oh man, I've been busting my tail for five, six, 10 years. I'm actually a little lonely too. And I want to talk to other business owners and entrepreneurs. So I started reaching out to entrepreneurs in my, in my marketplace that were doing other things, that owned the retail shop, that owned the coffee shops, that was opening up more than one coffee shop, that owned the car washes, the, the auto dealers, right? Mm-hmm. And you get relationships with them. Woo. I was just telling a, a friend in another marketplace, a uh, small market, 10,000 people, told him the same thing. I said, you write down the top 25 influential people in your town of 10,000 and you take them out to coffee. Hmm. Let me know what happens to your business. Yeah, that's year. right. They, right. And they appreciate it, you know? Mm -hmm. And guess what? They don't expect me to work with their referrals one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. That's right. Like, you know what I mean? So I then I then I have a team that I can refer to. So I'm actually building bigger relationships that I can refer to my agents in my marketplace. So that got me from like 6%, 8% to 10, you know, and better at times, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one strategy uh, or a tactic I think you could have. Now, the, the, the other one is you have to realize that you... When I hit 20% market share, and I haven't been there every single year, but that year I did, I, I was like, okay, I got 20, let's go to 40. <laughs> mm -hmm. What I realized was there was no amount of radio ads. There was, there was no amount of billboards. There was no amount of ads that would get me there. Mm -hmm. There was a law of diminishing return because I, I was losing, I wasn't losing business to the top agents. I was losing business to the average agent and to the less than average agent. Because I'm not at every church. Yeah. I'm not ever, I'm not on every school board. I'm not ever PTA meetings. I'm not on every coach, right? So there's so many agents out there that if you want to grow wide, you have to have agents on your team in that are in pockets, different yeah. pockets outside of those sandbox. So that's the way I think about it. That's right. 
Man, this has been so helpful. And, I, and uh, you know, again, um, if you haven't uh, or, or if you forgot the name, it's called Million Dollar Agent. Um, God, this has been a great interview. I, I think one of the things that I like to ask uh, each of the people that we have on is, hey, what are your three favorite books? Right. What? So we have yours, right? Besides, <laughs> what the, are, one besides the one you're. Yeah. What are your three favorite books uh, for real estate agent? Oh, for a real estate agent? Well, no, just, I, I guess maybe just your three favorites. Okay. So, so top of, top of mind right now, um, the psychology, psychology of money by Morgan Housel. Um, I actually worked with him for over a year prior to me writing my book. That book sold over 3 million copies is a great read. And, and I think under understanding money is going to, is, and, and getting through the limiting beliefs that we have around money is going to be really impactful for you and for your life. Um, I also love BE 2.0 beyond entrepreneurship by Jim Collins. Mm -hmm. There's also beyond entrepreneurship and BE 2.0. I, I, I listen or read that every single year as a, as a business leader. And I recommend that highly. Um, couple other books thinking fast and slow by daniel kahneman mm -hmm. is such a fantastic book and and so many books have been written because the author read that book and they take one of the ideas there's probably a hundred ideas in there mm -hmm. and they'll take one and it'll be a whole book so you can think about how dense and awesome that book is yeah absolutely that's a, an amazing book now for real estate agents um, Robert Cialdini or Caldini, Cialdini influence, hmm. understanding that book influence will help you in marketing, advertising, sales, scripting, human behavior. Um, and so I would recommend those and I could go on and on because I, I ride my bike <laughs> all the time. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you you're guys. listening to books all the time. I'm listening to audibles all the time. Yeah. That's great. Well, Nick, again, thank you so much for sharing your time and wisdom with us uh, on the podcast. Um, again, the book Million Dollar Agent by Nick McLean. Uh, listeners, please take some time. Uh, we're going to be doing some more great interviews coming up. So make sure you take the time to like and subscribe, comment. Uh, tell us what you loved about this episode. And again, Nick, thank you so, so much. We're so happy to have you. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, really Appreciate fun. your time. Yeah, really fun. Awesome.